Welcome everyone to today's workshop with the Community College Consortium for Open Educational Resources. The topic today is the culture shift to academic freedom, where we will be discussing the connections between uh, academic freedom, open educational resources, and uh, publisher offerings such as inclusive access, among other things. And so I'm very excited to get started with all this. Before we do, I just wanted to tell everybody that we are testing out a captioning service for this day. So if you're interested in turning that on, then down at the bottom of the Zoom screen, you, uh, one of the options uh, should say either closed captioning or we'll say more and you can click on that and then you'll see the captioning as an option uh, if that is of interest. So first we'll do some introductions and go through uh, a little bit about CCC OER. And then we have a number of guests on a panel today who are gonna talk a little bit about their experiences with OER at their institutions. Um, and then after that, we have a set of questions to guide the discussion and we will be eventually moving forward to a QA and a at the end. So if you're in the audience, please feel free to enter questions in the chat if you want and we will kind of try to monitor that. And then at the end, we'll try to leave, make sure that we leave a few minutes open uh, so that we can address those questions. And then at the very, very end, we have um, a couple of, upcoming events to let you know about as well. And as I said, we have a panel of speakers today, uh, a, a range of folks from faculty, students, and administrators here. Um, and they will all have the opportunity to introduce themselves in a moment. Uh, and myself, if you don't know, as you might have heard me before, because I've done a couple of these webinars with CCC OER, but um, I'm Matthew Bloom. I'm English faculty at Scottsdale Community College, and I'm the Open Educational Resources Coordinator for the Maricopa County Community College District. Um, and so I'm very excited. I'm one of the uh, executive uh, uh, council members for CCC OER. So um, before we get to actually introducing formally, I'm giving the, the panelists the opportunity to introduce themselves. I just wanted to say a couple of words about what CCC OER is. Um, we are an organization of community colleges in North America who strives to support faculty, uh, and raise awareness about open educational resources and uh, bring you know, various community members together in collaboration and try to, as it says here, foster uh, that OER leadership. And obviously the end goal of all of this is higher uh, student success rates, right? It's supporting students. And so uh, that's what CCC OER is all about. And we actually have a pretty broad membership across uh, across the United States. And as you can see, if you go to the, the URL there, you can see more details, but we have uh, pretty much membership from coast to coast there. Um, some states we have yet to get into, but maybe that'll happen in the future. So one of the themes of today uh, is, does have to do with choices about, you know, how, how do you make those choices? about moving to a low cost alternative to a traditional textbook or you know what is the reasoning for going to completely free and you know what are some of the benefits and, and potential consequences of those kinds of decisions and of course wrapped up in all of that are these new publisher offerings relatively new um, offerings that are, are called inclusive access or um, some people I've heard um, uh, called it call it automatic billing and so one of the things that has happened recently is that a number of organizations, as you can see down at the bottom here from CCC OER to OpenStax and, and OE Global, Creative Commons, Spark, Student Perks, um, all the others there, <laughs> they have all come together to uh, start this uh, initiative called Free the Textbook. And if you go to this URL right here, uh, you have the opportunity to sign up and get involved. They have toolkits for student activism and also for those who are interested in supporting students. And it's a really great resource for learning about the issues related to inclusive access and to open educational resources generally. And I, I strongly encourage everyone to check it out because um, there are some great resources on that site. So without further ado, I would like to turn this over to the first of our panelists here to take a few minutes to introduce yourself. Um, it's Elisa Cooper, who's English faculty at Glendale Community College, which is right here in Maricopa, which is in the Phoenix, Arizona area. So Elisa, you wanna go ahead and introduce yourself? Yeah, thank you, Matthew. So Matthew and I work together. Um, as he said, I'm at uh, Glendale, which is one of the uh, 10 community colleges in our district. We are the second largest 
and for one semester we were the largest and we really like to brag about that but uh, so um, we've been involved in the OER movement since 2013 and uh, before Matthew took over three years ago as our leader of OER um, I was part of a tri-chair uh, committee team that organized all the things all the great things that he's doing now but um, um, I like to feel like Maricopa has been one of the the major players in the OER and whenever we go to different conferences uh, we would always share what we were doing and and trying to advocate for others to to get involved but um, you know we had initial an initial goal to save students five million dollars in five years and i think after five years we had saved students over 11 million and i'm not even sure if we're still counting since um, i haven't been directly involved in three years um, but uh, I think that's a great achievement for us. Um, one thing that's unique about our initiative is that um, instead of just saying no cost, trying to uh, uh, encourage faculty to be uh, no cost, ours was a no cost, low cost. And we set that low cost number at 40. So anything under $40, $40 we uh, included it in our count for our, our OER numbers. Um, so. One of the things that we do well in our in our uh, district is that we have the initiative that creates um, dialogue days. You know, we're involved in conferences. Um, we have online training. We even have a grant program that encourages faculty to either create or adopt um, OER materials. And I think that's pretty much it. I know Matthew knows a lot more than I do, so if he wants to jump back in, he can. But uh, anyway, that's me. Welcome. Much, Elisa, and um, I just wanted, you know, to, to, to say publicly thank you so much for all the work that you and the, the other tri chairs did at the beginning of the Miracle Millers project to get all of that moving. I have just done my best not to ruin it. <laughs> You've done a great job. <laughs> <laughs> all right, next we have uh, Barbara Gooch. She's a student at Volunteer State Community College and an OpenStax intern. And Barbara, would you like to uh, talk a little bit about your experience and, and your role? Sure. Yes, I am an OpenStax national intern. Um, they invited me to come back for the next year, which I'm very excited about. The first year that I was there, it was uh, really a, a campus advocacy project to try to um, promote OER. And we, we, let me clarify, we got to choose our campus advocacy project. And I went ahead and stayed with the OER and um, tried to introduce OER more to those professors that have haven't chosen or were still reluctant and um, unfortunately right when I was really hammering it down um, we had a tornado in our area and then of course COVID hit so I'm actually excited that um, I was extended so that maybe I can continue that work which I had actually I had planned on doing anyways but um, this, this year, my role is also to work with the institutional partners that um, is with OpenStack. So I'm really excited to see where my role takes me this time and um, how much more I can learn about OER and maybe be on the flip side with you guys one day instead of just a student. But I appreciate you allowing me to be here and um, I thank the Community College Consortium for also inviting me to be in here. Thank you, Barbara, so much. And we've uh, included on this slide here a number of blog posts uh, that you wrote with OpenStax. Do you, do you want to say anything about any of these in particular or kind of kind of let us? And all the community college had some money coming in terms of a uh, OER grant. And so we really kicked off an initiative then. Uh, and it's grown ever since. And um, what makes me really, really happy is uh, this fall, about 70% of all our classes are completely OER. So we went from having zero in 2016 uh, to almost 70% to not, uh, now. And so that's really a great number. Um, if you could just go to the next slide. Uh, next one, there we go. So I come from uh, Roxbury Community, which is in Boston. Uh, we, uh, we were funded or founded just like everyone else in the late 60s, early 70s. We were a small school, a little over uh, 2,000 students. And we're much more traditional than what community colleges have turned into now. So we're much more traditional a community college. So we're primarily female. We're, um, we are uh, 
you know, primary um, minority-based or st uh, students of color. Um, and we, our average age, as you can take a look at the slide, is 32 years old. So, you know, the trend is to have more high school students coming to community college, but that's not the case here. And um, so, um, you know, we're, we're much more of a traditional community college, uh, of, you know, that was in the past of, of working parents trying to uh, get a degree. You can just go to the next slide. Um, and so we're an urban college and our demographics, our students are, are you know, in the lower economic uh, sphere of, of things. Um, and, you know, um, at least 45% of our students um, are parents and at least have two, two children. Uh, so, um, you know, they've got a lot of other things going on um, in their lives than just, uh, you know, uh, college. And so that's why, you know, certainly OER became really, really important and the affordability issue here at, at RCC. And I'm, I'm very happy to join you here today. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Bill, for coming. Uh, we are happy to have you. And last on, uh, on our panel today is uh, Veronica Howard. She is um, Associate Professor of Psychology at the University of Alaska, Anchorage. So Veronica, you wanna go ahead and introduce yourself and let us know what your, what, what your work at the University of Alaska is like. Hey everyone, good morning. I'm joining you from Anchorage, Alaska. Uh, I'm Veronica Howard. I live and work on the land of the Denaina El Nina. And so I'm so pleased to be here today to be included in the conversation. I did also include a little bit of information about our institution on the next slide. And uh, the University of Alaska Anchorage is uh, a little bit unique. We're a large open enrollment institution. Uh, again, we're built on the land of the Denaina El Nina. And we're considered within the University of Alaska system to be the metropolitan campus and we have a really strong kind of professional credentialing and workforce development focus but what's really interesting about the University of Alaska system is that there are no community colleges in Alaska all of our institutions are within the same system so at UAA we serve students who might uh, outside or in the lower 48 be considered a community college student but we also are a PhD granting institution so we're pretty unique we have a very diverse uh, range of students and preparation levels coming in. We also serve students who, you know, are, are quite diverse uh, demographically and socioeconomically. So we have been focusing on improving the financial accessibility of our institution since about 2015, and I'm privileged to be part of the group that is promoting textbook affordability on our campus. I'm really pleased to be able to join you today. Thank you so much, Veronica. So today, uh, you know, one of the, it, when we first began thinking about what this webinar was gonna be like, you know, we wanted to address some of these sometimes somewhat tricky topics related to um, choices, learning materials choices, um, how institutional initiatives can not uh, only empower faculty, but also potentially limit faculty. I mean, we wanted to have some of those hard decisions about or hard discussions about um, you know the kind of impact all the different ways in which the choice to go to uh, a zero cost or to an open source alternative to the traditional textbook we wanted to really look at how that resonates in in all kinds of different ways and so the way we framed it basically is is in three different topics and we're going to have um, some guiding questions and i'm just going to probably do my best to be quiet and let all of the brilliant folks on our panel respond to those questions and, and foster that discussion. Um, the first, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about teaching practices and how that is how, how that's been impacted by this shift towards um, academic freedom, uh, which goes along with the adoption of open materials that can be customized and that can be retained and, and all of that. Um, and then also thinking about institutional pressures, whether it is a, you know an initiative or whether or not it is kind of like you know a departmental or an, uh, institutional culture, uh, that kind of impact that that can have on, on the choice of learning materials. And then of course, the hot topic of, of many days recently in a lot of open education discussions is um, automatic learning. So moving, going ahead and moving straight into it. Um, I'm, what I'd like to do is just kind of read the questions out and then I'm gonna open it up to the panel and see um, you know, what responses and kind of you know, what folks have to say about it. So first of all, when it comes to teaching practices, how is it that open educational resources impact faculty's freedom to engage with students? 
uh, what and who does it empower, and how is it limiting, potentially? And then the second kind of in this suite of questions is how does this shift in teaching practices prompted by open education impact educators who are comfortable and arguably uh, effective with their use of publisher materials? You know, I, I, I will just say as a faculty member myself, I know that it can sometimes be extremely challenging to have a discussion um, with the faculty member right across the hallway from you, more difficult than it is to have a discussion uh, potentially with somebody from a totally different college who is a little bit more open-minded, right? So um, those are some of the questions and I would just like to go ahead and, and hand it over. Who wants to, to take a stab? Hi, Matt, um, it's Bill, I'll, 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 I'll wing it first. Um, so, you know, I think, um, you know, in terms of um, OER, in terms of um, academic freedom or, or faculty freedom, um, it's certainly, um, what I think it does is it, it creates flexibility for both. So, in other words, um, certainly the instructor um, has the ability to uh, present and to create and to, um, you know, put out quality materials uh, based on what they want to do. So, certainly that empowers the instructor to, um, you know, to engage students. And in terms of the, uh, the students, um, you know, again, it's flexibility. They're not tied down to a textbook. They can, um, they can, um, they're, they're involved, engaged in, in, in the classes that have OER. So I think it's a kind of a win-win for both. Uh, you know, certainly in terms of limits, you know, OER you know, has its barriers, particularly for, you know, at my institution before this semester, a um, big barrier was certainly technology and access to OER. Um, and so many students didn't have computers at home that they could access the, the OER. So there's always barriers to it, but, um, you know, overall, I think it's been a positive impact. Yeah, I would um, add to that, that, you know, OER became really important to me when I started doing more online teaching. And one of the things that really what I felt prohibited me from doing a good job was that, you know, how do I engage these students in the online environment when all I have is this textbook? And so I started looking at different ways to add media, you know, just programs that you could use to create something that's more than just read chapter five. And so I think that really gave me, OER gave me the freedom to be able to not just have to sit down and spend hours creating my own content, but to actually go out and be able to look and find things that were, were already available and open to use. And so then I could take that content and put it in a more engaging format where students are not just reading a textbook, they can watch videos that I've created or you know slides with audio and different things where I can actually ask questions as they are going through the material. So I really felt like that was the biggest freedom for me in, in, in helping engage students in that online environment. And to build off uh, what Elisa is describing, I, I think I came to OER for some similar reasons, but my primary recollection of the switch was just a deep dissatisfaction with the lack of freedom that I had with a uh, publisher's material. Um, we know that there's been kind of a transition into a greater emphasis on homework systems and interactive textbook materials for students. And as a new faculty member, I, I went through three or four semesters adopting a different textbook in each subsequent semester because of just frustration, dissatisfaction. Students had trouble getting into and accessing the homework system. And it wasn't actually until after I just threw up my hands and said, I don't even care which textbook I use, but I'm going to go with that open psych textbook and just be done with it, that I started to reflect on the relationship that I had previously had with my textbook materials. And I had been tightly and uncomfortably tethered to the material as it was presented in the book. I didn't want to assign material outside of the book, especially not out of the homework system, because it would have been very difficult and, and cumbersome to explain to students how to get access to that material. Uh, Non-publisher material doesn't always jive well. It doesn't mesh together with publisher homework platforms. And once I made the decision to switch, I 
I have not gone back and I will not go back because just like Elisa was saying, the material that I create is very purposeful. It's very careful and strategic to meet my learning outcomes. And I'm not beholden to material that presents uh, concepts incorrectly, inadequately, uh, or in a way that I don't want the material to be presented so that it fits better within my larger alignment, within the larger spirit of my course. Oh, but I didn't speak to how is it limiting? Oh my Lord, does it take so much time? But I, I think we all know that. I think we know that the, the process of course redesign takes a lot of time and it's really only through having a community of very interested and passionate partners who can lighten that load, you know, many hands make light work, that the process will get easier. I do have a follow-up question, but I'm also just curious to know if um, Barbara would be willing to kind of let us know your thoughts from the student's perspective. Um, we've heard an administrator talk about, um, about the impact that this might have on, on giving faculty freedom and two faculty members talking about how the ability to kind of own and customize those materials has really been empowering. And I'm just wondering from the student's perspective if that is something that you feel um, as, as the learner at the center of this whole uh, thing. Yeah, I think it is empowering to um, allow your professors to customize it to the students that, you know, if they're seeing that they're struggling within something to maybe say, you know, I'm going to break from what this textbook says and um, revise it to where the students may be um, getting more out of it later. Um, I did want to add something to Veronica's point. Um, I've, I've had um, professors that have used pretty much primarily OER that you can tell that they did not, uh, that they pretty much designed it themselves. And um, like right now I'm taking a social media for ed for entertainment class um, just to learn a little bit more about social media aspects. And he has several different outside sources and articles that we go to. And I think as long as you really plug it in to the um, course design, we have um, D2L, Desire to Learn, is our platform. And I think as long as you really set it up well, I think parents or, or students can go ahead and follow those outside sources, you know, well, it's, it's, it's a matter for me, it's a matter of clicking it and going to it. So within that aspect, I, I actually dropped another class that was $70 for basically almost the same course and went ahead and kept this one because it was OER, understanding that I would be having a lot of links and stuff like that. So he, you know, he really um, customized it to his needs and what he felt like would really help us in the long run to gain that knowledge. And I do appreciate it. Um, limiting may be that it's not set up for you, that you do have to put that work into it. Um, but I, I do, I think that overall also, um, that we just appreciate that, that the teachers or professors are noticing that we might be struggling with something or not as interested or something like that, that we can uh, plug in something else to help us gain that perspective better. Yeah, thank you so much. I hope that answered that. <laughs> yeah, no, that's fantastic. And, and I appreciate everyone's willingness to uh, to, to open this conversation up this way, again, no pun intended, it's just impossible to use that word in this context without feeling like you did it on purpose. But um, the, the follow-up question that I had, and this is kind of rephrasing in a sense the second question here, um, but one thing that I did pick up in, a, in some of, of, of the discussion so far is that there is a kind of sensitivity um, regarding the regarding an educator's kind of sense of identity and the choice of materials they use and the pedagogy that they employ. And I'm just wondering if, you know, thinking about it from the perspective of a faculty or some, an educator who may be reluctant to, you know, abandon the materials that they feel have been effective for them, despite the cost to the students. Um, I'm just wondering, you know, do, do you do you feel that those kinds of reluctant, th those who are reluctant to shift over, um, 
do, do they feel a really close connection? Is it, is, it, is it kind of interpreted potentially as an attack on their identity when we do um, almost demand, especially if it's an institutional demand, and I don't want to get ahead of ourselves because there's a whole slide about that stuff, but I'm just wondering if, if anyone has any thoughts about you know, that choice right there, because I, I do think that sometimes, you know, the, the, the selling of the OER in terms of selling it and um, persuading someone to, um, to, to be open to using uh, free and open resources, um, I feel like sometimes that is a, is a pressure from other faculty members and even from students that, that can be a threat. And I'm just wondering if, if you have any thoughts on that. I, you know, I think, I think when I talk to faculty uh, that have not adopted OER and they're still using their textbook, it's really a, a different teaching philosophy that they have. You know, these are a lot of face-to-face -face instructors who do a lot of really creative things in their classroom that don't really e revolve around that textbook. But I, I sort of see it as it's sort of their um, safety blanket. You know, here's this chapter, I, and I'm making them read this chapter, but then when they come into the classroom, they're doing a lot of creative things. So they don't really look at it as I'm not, I'm missing out on something. And, and I think the part that they don't see is that, you know, you just charge your students that $70, $80 for that textbook that you're really not using. You know, I mean, they're using it in the sense that they're expecting the students to read it. But I imagine that what they're doing in their classroom is probably good enough that they don't even need that. So, I, I, you know, I, it's hard to convince people to spend all that time that Veronica mentioned and that effort to, to use something different when they can just say, well, I'm just going to use that. But, you know, I still have a, gr a great engaging face to face classroom. Well, and I want to defer to others and make room for other perspectives, but there, honestly, there's no better time to be talking about this issue in our institution. Our, our student government actually just passed a resolution, uh, resolution 2015, uh, about concerns with course delivery as we've transitioned to uh, alternate delivery. So most of our courses are delivered remotely now due to the COVID-19 pandemic. And it's really emphasizing the weak points in course delivery. You know, building on what Elisa said, you can have a course where you use a commercial textbook, but then you come in and you enrich the environment and you have a really beautiful, wonderful, dynamic dialogue with your students. But when you don't have that space anymore, all of the, the emphasis tends to kind of get pushed onto the course material that you're using. Uh, I think that's been supported by some some research by Virginia Clinton, the, the emphasis on the, the material, the textbook in an online course. The student government's resolution was a push for faculty to be more involved in their courses, to create more materials, to rely less on publisher homework system, publisher platforms, publisher materials, and to have more engagement with students. So students really want to have that engagement. But as much as students at our institution are hearing that and going, yeah, that, yeah, that captures the spirit of some of the things that I, that I've been feeling, but maybe didn't have words to give, the reaction has been very painful from the instructors who are reading that resolution because it is a global pandemic and and most of us were not prepared for delivering our courses online we uh, certainly are not adequately compensated for uh, transitioning so quickly to online delivery and so uh, many folks bless them just to get through and to get by have potentially uh, switched to a free publishers homework system to get them through to support students in the best way that they know how in the words of a colleague recently, she was uh, sort of commiserating on the fact that she wants to do more, she wants to support her students, but even uh, adapting one of her slide presentations into an online um, material, into a narrated PowerPoint presentation for her takes 10 hours. And that's 10 hours for one lecture, not including the building of the course or the scoring of any assessments or, or any of that. So I think that Yes, the, the push for OER has really highlighted a lot of places institutionally and culturally 
where we have begun to weaken in higher education, the compensation and the honoring of high quality teaching practices, uh, the time involved in developing and delivering uh, courses. We're not thinking about that as much anymore because we've we've sort of become inured and used to all of these time-saving devices and metrics. And I can't speak from the administrative perspective, so I hope that William will speak to that perspective. But it can be really easy to forget just how much time goes into good teaching. So I, I really agree. And um... You know, it's a fine line when we're, when we're talking about, you know, trying to develop a uh, OER culture. Uh, and um, what, what happens is, and now I'll talk, they're not just, uh, you know, uh, instructors who are comfortable using their, you know, their um, print textbook. Um, but what, ha what happens is um, when, I, when I approach people or even promote things, I, there's a fine line between, you know, kind of hitting people over the head with a hammer and then kind of laying off and, and knowing when it's time to back off a little bit. And um, so a lot, of, a lot of my work is, is trying to establish a culture and so that the pressure isn't so great on the individual um, uh, instructors as it is kind of, it's the way things are done. And um, we certainly don't put pressure on, on uh, instructors who don't use OER. That, again, um, you know, this is an uh, academic freedom shop here. Um, but I think we, we look at it, we try to educate them and we try to um, um, talk to them about, you know, what OER, what the advantages of OER, um, you know, are and what, you know, particularly when it comes to, um, you know, cost savings, obviously, and trying to get them um, off the, you know, the $400 textbook when we can say, look, we have something that's just as good, so. Well, thank you so much for every, uh, this discussion already has been, has been fantastic. It's already in some senses, I think, moved into uh, a little bit this idea of institutional pressures. I know especially um, uh, some of the stuff that Bronco was talking about, like some of the, you know, underlying <laughs> things that are going on, um, you know, when it comes to changing the way that we think about teaching. And um, this, this kind of suite of questions here is designed to spark a discussion about institutional policies related to the adoption of open resources and how those pressures can both benefit and potentially harm uh, the work that we all try to do in open education. So uh, the first question is traditionally costly publisher textbooks have been the default. Why not make OER the default? What would be the implications for this at the department or division level? And then second question, what should institutional OER initiatives do to avoid the perception that they are infringing on faculty freedom, specifically, you know, faculty who are resistant? I'm not sure I would, I mean, I don't know what default, but I, I don't know if, if textbooks are the default, I guess is what I'm saying. I mean, I've always felt like we've, we've had the option to either choose the textbook that, it, and we're at, at my colleges, the two that I've been at, um, we chose books as a, as a committee. So we would have that option and there was always two there, but we also, also always had the option to not use those two. We couldn't use, I mean, we could use whatever we wanted. We have that academic freedom, but in our minds, we knew that we would either choose those two or we would do something on our own. And so I don't know for us if making one the default over the other. And I think what that does by making sort of this switch that's not necessarily needed, it sort of does put pressure on people to, to, to do something that maybe are not going to do a good job with it. I mean, I think that with anything, it's, it's almost like, you know, saying we're all going to teach online, which is kind of funny because we are all now doing it. But, you know, a lot of people don't want to do that. And so they don't do a really good job of it. And so the same thing with, with OER, you really want for the motivating factor to be that they really want to save students money, but they also want to be able to teach a course that's designed around their own style. So I think that I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily agree with an initiative that said we should all do this. 
I mean, I like the initiative that says this is available and look, you may not know about it and you should try it when you have time and we'll help you and we'll train you and we'll even give you grant money to do it. But just to, to sort of put it out there, I mean, people get a little freaked out about things like that and it changes their behaviors and how they do things. So I'd be cautious of that. Yeah, I think um, this is exactly right. Is is you know you, you tread on and you have actually lost academic um, freedom there. And um, although it'd be great in my eyes to to have a department um, you know adapt one OER for the whole, it's not you know in the end it's it's kind of not realistic, at least from uh, my point of view. Um, and nor do nor do I know if I want that to tell you the truth, but I do. Um, you know, the implications for the department are, are pretty big. So if you did have, let's say, um, you know, the biology, biology one picked one OER textbook or, or decided to go in and make, you know, and create a textbook, that is a tremendous amount of time. And um, so, you know, when, they, when you're thinking about how it impacts departments or, you know, or division level, we're talking about time, we're talking about money in terms of training and, you know, stipends. And so, you know, when we, when we talk about, you know, uh, let's say 100% OER to campus, you know, there's a lot of other things that go underneath them. Again, like I said, time and money and training and things like that. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that, you know, both William and Elisa have highlighted some of the challenges that come with uh, an overt push for OER. Um, like Jeff Gallant and Affordable Learning Georgia have also highlighted some of this in their recent work where faculty push back on the perception that they're being forced in a particular direction. Uh, the same is absolutely true in our system. You know, Alaska is a fiercely independent uh, culture. Uh, there's a lot of emphasis on freedom and individual choice. So instead of... Um, I should say, instead of coming in like the Kool-Aid man, but that's an absolute lie. I come into every conversation and like, hey, have you heard about OER? Can we get you into an OER? But it feels a little bit disingenuous because I actually can't do that in my own field, behavior analysis, because the resources don't exist in my field. So it's not that OER can be a default yet because the materials aren't yet there. However, I can be very careful and very mindful of some of the institutional um, levers, some of the, the, the way the system is designed to support. So like looking, for instance, at the course management system that our university uses, the metadata that's collected about textbook choices emphasizes a traditional publishing model. So perhaps I can put a little pressure there to change that system slightly. So maybe it prompts a course designer to say, hey, are any of these textbook options open? Uh, or I can look at some of the other systems that surround uh, the faculty decision, like promotion and tenure guidelines. Do we highlight the adoption of OER as innovative teaching practices or a practice that promotes diversity and equity and inclusion? for our students? Can we explicitly include the creation of an openly licensed material as a, a preferred form or a desirable form of uh, research or creative activity? So rather than, you know, just coming in full stop, you have to do OER, uh, it might be better to consider some of the subtle ways in which we can change the system to promote that choice. Well, great. Thank you, everyone. And I see that there's been a little bit of action in the chat over here, um, specifically with respect to this topic of choice versus mandate. And um, obviously, that's a big deal. And just, you know, speaking as a faculty member, I know that and in my experience, my relatively limited experience um, as a, a faculty member, the, the fact is, is that there is kind of an implicit tension between um, administrative initiatives and individual faculty choice. And, um, you know, when it comes to academic freedom and it comes to not just the choice of learning materials, but uh, and then a whole number of things. And so I'm just, <clears throat> I think that we've touched upon it already, um, but I'm wondering if anyone here has anything to say in, in addition, like to go into a little bit more 
about um, you know why it is problematic or what experiences have you had in um, specifically in in trying to engage with those faculty um, if you do have an institutional initiative without actually um, you know making it seem like a mandate um, and, and I know that seems like a rambly question but I guess just to kind of contextualize it you know I know that one of the reasons why the Maricopa Millions Project was um, seemed to work well um, was because of the fact that it was it was primarily a grassroots initiative it just happened to have a good amount of administrative support and it was the it was like the, the synergy of those things that made it work um, because we had funding from the top but the people who were driving it were the faculty um, obviously Alisa you know you were part of that uh, that project but I'm wondering if the others here on the panel have seen that to be the case um, and then I of course would always love to hear um, from the student side of things whether or not this entire discussion is even relevant to the student I think that that might be an interesting um, uh, take on it as well. Yeah, I think it is relevant to us in the decisions that obviously um, <laughs> the faculty makes um, what I was going to touch on and it might go a little bit off base on student perspective is um, the faculty freedom as far as in the state of Tennessee is actually within law that those the staff members should have academic freedom. However, um, within the research that I did, what's happening is, of course, like the department head is actually deciding the books for everyone. And so therefore, um, <laughs> lower staff really doesn't seem to have as much academic freedom. Perhaps they don't realize they have that academic freedom, that it is actually in law that they are allowed to choose something else. Or maybe it's just, well, they reviewed it for us, therefore we're gonna take it. Um, the other thing is, is I've noticed um, one time a department had actually made a whole course, and this was actually in a college experience. So one credit uh, class, and they made the course, but now they're charging $50 a student to take that as a textbook. And I actually said, hey, there are free alternatives out there for students, you know, that actually, you know, with my involvement in OpenStax, there was a college success book that I, I was aware of. I'm actually in it and said, you know, why don't you guys consider this? And they're like, well, we already did this. And I get their time and their effort, but we're talking $50 <laughs> and for one credit class. And I know that might not sound a lot, but when you think, let's pretend like it's 10 hours, or $10 an hour that a student works, that's five hours. They're having to work for that one textbook when there's a free copy out there that they really wouldn't even look at. And so what I ended up doing was actually contacting a few of the individual teachers and said, hey, there's this alternative, would you take a look at it? And there, it's almost, it's a weird thing. Like even if they know they have academic freedom, they're scared to go against it. I've seen, you know, more, it seems like they're scared versus some, yeah, I had one professor last year that uh, I've actually trying to help him switch to, you know, open ed or whatever. Um, and he was like, you know what guys, biology is biology. I don't care what book you get. It's all the same topic, whatever. His problem is, is, and I noticed someone had put this in the chat is the other resources that are needed. For instance, the labs. And so we're trying to come up with components for him to possibly replace those labs, especially now that we're on online and stuff. But yeah, it's, it's kind of, you know, where does academic freedom, where does that really stand with teachers to be able to go ahead and pick what they want? Well, thank you so much. I mean, that, I think that that really helps to put this into perspective and, and um, I did want to, before we move on to the, the final kind of topic here as we, we approach the end of our webinar today, um, I did notice a question um, uh, from James uh, Glapa Grossflag in the chat that I wanted to, um, to, to share with the panelists and see if anyone had any thoughts about that because it's directly related to this question of why not the default. So he says, changing the institutional or cultural perspective is hard but necessary. We provide free Wi-Fi and free athletic equipment. Many schools now provide free mental health support and food pantries. 
all good, but if we can do all that, then why not instructional materials? Well, and I think maybe that's not 100% accurate. We, we provide those things to students for free, but they're not free. You know, somebody is paying for them somewhere. And it's just a question of whether we have connected the fee structure, the resources on the institution, you know, in the environment with supporting that uh, as something that is important. So shifting that culture really, I think, is about connecting the dots between this is supporting student success, not only as a supporting student success it, and, and retention in the course and keeping students engaged in completing their coursework, but it's doing so uh, disproportionately for students who are traditionally minoritized and underrepresented in higher education. But that's a hard sell because you're also working against a culture where the person who is making the decision about what material to adopt came up in that culture, right? I cannot tell you how many times I have heard a colleague say, well, when I was a student, fill in the blank. That's a hard thing to shift. Yeah, and I just, I just want to add, it's different too, in that you can't just say we're going to provide the OER for the courses because in, a, in an English department, like my department, there's 40 of us. Well, English reading, journalism, all that. But there's 40 of us. And, you know, whereas OER, it, there's more benefits than just here's a free resource for students. The benefits are to us, too. So if I'm going to use OER, I don't want someone to give it to me. You know, I want to be able to customize it and make it myself. So just saying that we can provide that, that there's still a lot of challenges in that. Yeah, and you know, that goes right back to that connection between, you know, identity and pedagogy and choice of, of materials and the desire to be able to customize and kind of personalize it a little bit. And, you know, that's one thing I know that a lot of faculty who, who I've worked with who, who may even not even require a textbook, but they don't want to use OER because they say that they are the textbook. I've actually heard the faculty say that, like, I don't use a textbook because I am the textbook. And then, <laughs> whether or not we agree with that, uh, with that attitude, that is a, a kind of thing that I think that we do also find um, that desire to really um, be have that personal connection uh, with with the materials that you're using so because of time um, I know that this concept of automatic billing um, which which is the term that I, I've heard used by uh, like US perks and, and some other folks who um, who really wanted to make transparent I think like the fact that inclusive access is the kind of Orwellian term um, you know, so it's like inclusive access and we can maybe interpret it as neither inclusive nor uh, really promoting access um, and so the questions here I know could take up we could do a whole webinar on inclusive access but we're not really thinking about that but just specifically the impacts on this this choice to transition to a different kind of teaching and to exercise academic freedom so how is it that um, that these are symptoms, right, that this kind of, um, of course, you know, materials offerings from the publishers, how is it that we might be able to see that as symptoms of larger institutional issues, maybe related to academic freedom and, and the way that, um, that that teaching and learning is, is, is changing? Um, and then what are the long-term implications of adopting something like that um, in order to solve what are potentially short-term problems, uh, especially in light of the pandemic? And then finally, um, how do these offerings impact academic learning? So, um, go ahead and ask. So, if you guys don't mind, I'll take this one um, first because I am very <laughs> knowledgeable about this just from pretty much experience, I guess you can say. And um, I guess I want to touch on the second one. Um, what are the long-term implications of adoption to short-term problem? I think short, well, it had been a long-term problem, but what it was trying to solve was obviously the cost of publishing textbooks, you know, to have to, students to have to buy that and stuff. And so they came up with, hey, let's offer these digital textbooks with homework platforms that will help faculty, but also give it less to students. However, that has not been my experience. What has happened instead 
um, and the symptom, you know, that ended up creating was it actually cost us more. Um, I am not the only one right now in college. Actually, all six of us are in college. So that's four kids and my husband and myself. And my daughter, for instance, my daughter and my husband are both taking econ right now. Both of them had to pay $75 a person for inclusive access. Now, <laughs> there was no way around it. They had to get to do the course and to do the homework. They had to have this. And what we would normally do, for instance, we, me and my husband took history together. We shared the textbook. We found it cheap. We found it free. And, um, we're able to get it that way. So sometimes, and actually every time inclusive, inclusive access or access codes have been involved, I've ended up paying more than I would have had I found a publisher's textbook. And so I think what it's doing is it's, it's stripping away the rights to, to share a book, to buy it used, to look for other, um, you know, books, you know, compare them to and stuff because um, what the state of Tennessee has done, again, from the research is they made a contract with one of the inclusive access to, in hopes of lowering the price, you know, and then all these, you know, and they had a digital engagement initiative and everything to get these teachers on board and stuff. And so, but they have to sell so many to get that price. Well, in doing that, they have, created special codes just for that campus. And so therefore, even if we were to have found inclusive access somewhere else for cheaper, we can't use it. We have to buy it from the campus. So we are locked into purchasing that particular one from that campus. And then what does that also create? If they didn't pay for that, they're either dropping the course or they're making pretty much an F because everything is behind that paywall. And so they can't even, they're, they're pretty much they're fa they failed even before they get begin, you know, they cannot complete that course. So uh, the longer, you know, implications of this is you're locking a lot of students out that can't afford it. I mean, where they might've been able to borrow a friend's or get it from the library or even, um, you know, skip it, just not even have it. They can't, you can't even do the homework anymore. And I think that's the huge takeaway that professors need to take with it. I get that it might be more time on your hand, but we're there to empower students. And I think that we need to remember that the students need to be focused. And sometimes inclusive access is not including everybody. And we're locking, people out you know we've worked so hard you guys have worked so hard to break a lot of barriers and instead this is just the larger implication of something you know more and then the other thing i'd like to bring up is you know we live in rural areas and i know matthew you even said hey you know we're getting ready to have three people on the internet at one time you know there are students here that didn't even have the internet and it really showed its head, of course, during COVID, you know, when everybody went online and stuff. And we need to think about, you know, if we're doing this, you know, homework behind a paywall, who are we affecting? What are those students that might have been able to take courses that weren't online or didn't have those online implications? Who are we knocking those out? And it's probably a lot of lower income students. So I apologize that was long, but this is my baby right here. <laughs> so I think what I had read on the um, I couldn't have said it any better, Barbara. Good job. Um, so I, I think you used a key word there. You said it locks us into something because, you know, just like you were saying, and you know, I'm talking now as a librarian, is if people didn't have their textbooks, then we could get a copy and put it on reserve. We could, um, you know, we could get it from another library or whatever it may be. We can't do this with these kind of materials. Uh, you know, we can't resell them. And um, so you're getting locked into a, 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 um, a resource that doesn't cost any less than what, you know, a print textbook would. And they say it's less, it's not. You can read tons and tons of literature on it. It's not less expensive than, than, than a regular textbook. So uh, I think the biggest word for this 
to me is choice. It reduces the choice that you have as both as an instructor and as a student in terms of your learning resources. I think that's the biggest takeaway I, I get from all this. So, um, you know, I think you did a great job explaining it to Barbara. Well, and I, and I hope there might just be a moment to build off something William just said, which was to, when you're talking about systems, to recognize that the reason that all of this is possible, the reason why inclusive access is allowed to do what it does, is because of the disparity in copyright law between technology and print media. So because technology, you can permit subscription models, you cannot have a secondhand market for subscriptions, materials like that in the same way that you do print bound textbooks. The publishers are building a system where they generate their own revenue by shifting from being publishers to being technology corporations. And it's just fascinating to think about. And I had no idea of how that worked until I actually took uh, the Harvard Copyright X program. Uh, but to look at the way in which the law permits different different access to these materials. Um, I just wanted to put it a plug in for the Copyright X program. We have a couple of uh, nominations. If anyone wanted to learn more or participate in that program, you know, please let me know because I'd love to nominate someone to do that program. But looking at not only the institution, but the, the country, the law, the way we support different uh, modes of access, the way our systems support or exclude is important too. Want the last word, Elisa? <laughs> or I can just jump right in. It's up to you. Yeah, no, you go ahead and jump right in because I have a whole different perspective and I, I don't have time. So you oh, go right ahead. That's, that's why we should have been quicker earlier. All right. Well, then I'm going to have to interview you or something. And do, so, anyway, Ray, thank you so much. We're at the end of things today. I'm going to do like this. We're going to have to sit for questions, obviously. Got a couple of webinars coming up, obviously, October 14th today. Uh, but we have. Um, the virtual open education conferences, which is going to be, I, I, I think, a really great experience, but a new experience for everyone. Um, so our November 4th webinar is focused on that. And then you can also see that uh, tracking key programming indicators for OER programs is the focus of the December 9th webinar. Um, just as a reminder to everyone, OE Global, um, one of the virtual conferences that is referenced in the previous slide, um, is happening soon. And you want to make sure that you register before October 30th. And then last but not least, please be sure to stay in the loop uh, with PCC OER. Um, there's all kinds of opportunities. Check out our website and all of that stuff. And with that, I will say thank you to our panelists. I think that this was a very engaging discussion. I hope that everyone enjoyed it as much as I did. And we hope to see you at future uh, webinars and other events, and hopefully physically someday once again. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Yeah.